Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Clemente Mejia, and I supervise the Foreclosure Prevention Program at the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Next slide. Uh, the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs was established in 1976, and its mission is to promote a fair and vibrant marketplace. We serve consumers, businesses, and communities through education, advocacy, and complaint resolution. To optimize your experience, keep the chat box open and look for the chat symbol to submit your questions. Questions will be answered during the webinar and at the end during the Q&A period. Welcome to another Help for Homeowners webinar session. This week, we'll be discussing the California foreclosure process. Homeownership is a major vehicle for creating family stability and is usually the only tool in which minorities can build generation wealth. However, during an economic downturn, Blacks and Latinos are 71 to 76% more likely to lose their homes than white homeowners. The ripple effects of the Great Recession of 2008 severely impacted household wealth and revenue to local governments. From 2008 to 2012, California homeowners lost more than $632 billion in home value, and in Los Angeles County, more than 364,000 homes fell into foreclosure, which resulted in a loss of approximately $190 million in tax revenue and $2.8 billion in foreclosure-related costs. The current crisis was triggered by a highly infectious virus, COVID-19, which made landfall in the US late last year. The virus quickly spread across the continent and health officials have taken necessary steps to slow down the spread of the disease. However, the, these efforts brought upon unintended consequences. As a result, 7.74% or 3.9 million mortgages in the US are on a forbearance plan. Additionally, 6% of mortgages in the Los Angeles were delinquent as of April 2020. Given that, understanding the foreclosure process in addition to the rights and responsibilities a homeowner has when going through foreclosure can be the difference between losing and saving your home. The DCBA, along with local housing counseling agencies, are working together to proactively outreach and inform property owners about available resources and where they can go to receive legitimate help. Today, we have two of our very own experts, Samuel Lequin and Leti Andrade, foreclosure prevention counselors, who will tell us more about the foreclosure process and where homeowners can get free, reliable help. Next slide. Here's the agenda for the presentation today. And the three areas that we'll be covering is the California foreclosure process, foreclosure prevention services, and the homeowner notification program. Okay, so before I turn it over to the presenters, just a reminder to our participants, please keep your microphones muted and use the chat box to submit your questions. Go ahead, Sam.
Okay, we apologize for the technical issues. Um, we're gonna have our second presenter, Leti Andrade, uh, come in and take over the presentation. Hi, Thank yes. Um, I hope you can hear me. So I'm gonna be discussing the homeowner notification program. So um, hopefully Sam will be able to fix um, his whatever technical issues he's going through right now. But if we can go to skip to the homeowner notification program, uh, slide 15, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, in the early 90s, the greater Los Angeles area experienced a significant increase in real estate fraud. There were reports from homeowners alleging their signatures were forged on recorded documents. In most cases, homeowners didn't become aware of this until homeowners start to notice they never received their tax bill or they received their tax bill under someone else's name or they started receiving eviction notices forcing them to move out. In 1996, the homeowner notification program began. The legislator en enacted a law that authorized the county to send recorded copies of certain documents to homeowners. The homeowner notification program allowed homeowners to be notified by mail any time a document that changes ownership or when a loan is taken out against the property is recorded with Los Angeles Register Recorder's office. This includes deeds, quick claim deeds, and deeds of trust. A copy of the recorded document is mailed to all interested parties as well as all addresses on file. This gives homeowners the best opportunity to review the real estate document to be sure they are legitimate and to avoid fraud. Next, please. In 2008, a foreclosure pandemic began to hit property owners across the country. In Los Angeles County, foreclosures filing peaked in 2009 with over 106,000 foreclosures. Approximately 7,300 households fell into foreclosure every month from 2007 through 2009. The foreclosure crisis led to the enhancement of the homeowner notification program. As mentioned before, the homeowner notification program required documents related to changes in ownership or documents related to loans to be sent to any interested party involved. Senate Bill 62 added to the homeowner notification program two documents to also be mailed out to the interested parties. These two documents are both related to foreclosure, the notice of default and the notice of trustee sale. The mailing of these documents also came with information about either understanding the documents housing assistance, and how to obtain additional information by phone or email. Senate Bill 62 allows the County of Los Angeles to provide a service which would not only answer questions related to why certain individuals has received a copy of a recorded document, but also advise or direct assistance on how to deal with moving forward. Senate Bill 827 allowed Los Angeles County recorders office to notify homeowners or occupants a notice of default or a notice of sale was recorded within 14 days of recordation. This timeline was reduced previously from 20 days. Recorded documents such as notice of default are public information. Some property owners may receive offers from organizations offering assistance or advice. By reducing the time to mail the notice, it gives the homeowners an opportunity to reach out to our office for no cost assistance, whether it be a simple explanation of a document or whether it require further attention. Assembly Bill number 1106 was approved by the governor, which allowed the County of Los Angeles to extend its homeowner notification program for an additional 10 years. This would extend until January 1st, 2030. Next slide. Okay. 
Okay, I do apologize. Are we can you allow Sam to Hello, forgive me. Test and uh can can uh okay. can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, oh I, I forgive me everybody for uh that uh, minor hiccup here. Um so we're going back to uh explaining what the foreclosure process is in the state of California, what it kind of looks like. Um in reality, foreclosure is is the legal process used by lenders to recover the balance of a loan when a property owner fails to meet the obligations of a loan. Um, foreclosure is, a, is just that, it's a process. Although California does have one of the fastest foreclosure processes in the country, the process is not completed overnight. As we move forward, I'd like to discuss with you the two types of foreclosures which can occur in California and a brief overview of the process. Next slide, please. So California is considered both a, uh, a, a judicial foreclosure state and a non-judicial foreclosure state. And the, the difference is actually kind of simple. Uh, a judicial foreclosure would involve a mortgage, which in reality involves a borrower and a lender only. Uh, when a borrower fails to meet those obligations, the lender would, would have to sue the borrower in court in order to foreclose against the property and recover any of their losses. Um, if the lender, in fact, wins, they would have the right to sell the property at auction to the highest bidder. Um, a non-judicial foreclosure, which is really the most common type of foreclosure in California, uh, is, is revolves around the idea of a deed of trust and not necessarily a mortgage. In a deed of trust, just like a mortgage, though, there's a borrower and a lender. However, there is a third party that also exists known as a trustee. In a deed of trust, a borrower would in fact convey the power to sell their property. It conveyed that power to the trustee. And should the borrower fail to meet any obligations of the loan, the trustee would begin the foreclosure process. That foreclosure process would purposefully, in the end, sell the property at auction in order to recover any losses incurred by the lender. When it comes to a deed of trust, the term borrower and mortgager, they're often used interchangeably. Sometimes the deed of trust document will, um, will sort of uh, indicate that the borrower, for example, me, if I have borrowed something, Samuel McKean, he's the borrower, but they will indicate that I'm a mortgager. Um, those, those terms are interchanged. It, it, it does not mean that the deed of trust, in fact, has turned into a mortgage. Uh, that document would still indicate the deed of trust has the power to sell the property without going to court. Uh, as mentioned before, California is a state where both foreclosure processes do exist. Generally though, it's a non-judicial state. Next slide. So the image we have here shows a high level overview of the non-judicial foreclosure process. If we look at the first step here, a non-judicial foreclosure begins. The very first step is the filing of what's called a notice of default. Now that notice of default is required to be recorded with the county recorder's office. The notice of default is the official beginning of the foreclosure process. Um, if you're behind on payments and maybe the notice of default has not been recorded yet, you would be what's called delinquent. Whether or not you have a four day, five day grace period, on the second day the payment is received, you are considered delinquent. Now, you are not considered in foreclosure or in default until this document is in fact recorded. Uh, the notice of default is, the, is often triggered by a borrower normally who's missing payments. Now, there are other factors that could trigger a notice of default, but typically it's triggered by a borrower missing payments. The notice of default is required to contain certain information, which we'll discuss later. Now, the second step in this image would be the notice of trustee sale. Now, the next step in this process would be this document being recorded, which would be recorded no earlier by law, no earlier than 90 days from the recording of the notice of default. Now, this document, like the notice of default, must contain certain information. One of the most important pieces of, inf of information that this document contains is the actual exact date the property will go to auction if nothing is done. Now, the next step would be the actual auction of the property. Now, the auction would take place, and once it does take place, once the property is brought to auction, four possible outcomes um, will, will appear. The first possible option, outcome would be the auction is in fact postponed. This postponement can be caused by a variety of reasons. It may be postponed because the lender and the borrower have a potential workout solution on the table, whether it be a loan modification or maybe the, the lender's received an offer to pay off the loan. 
Now the postponement comes because these offers and these options are not finalized. Uh, maybe the borrower has placed the property on the market and they have a strong buyer and the lender is willing to hold off on the foreclosure to see if they're gonna be guaranteed uh, their full money back through a, a, a regular straight sale. Uh, another common reason for postponing an auction would be a borrower who filed bankruptcy. Uh, the second auction would be if a minimum bid at the auction required to satisfy the trustee sale um, was not met by any outside bidder. In this case, the lender would be required to purchase the property at the minimum bid and they themselves would become the new owner. The third option is a third party wins at the auction. They either meet the minimum bid or they surpass, surpass any other bidders. That would make them the new owner of the property. The fourth option would be if the auction, in fact, is canceled. Typically, this happens when a workout solution has been officially accepted. Uh, for example, the lender may not simply be considering a workout option, but they have uh, approved the workout option, such as a loan modification. Or maybe the uh, borrower has come into some money and they have the ability to pay the loan off completely, and they submitted it, and the lender said, hey, we have all the money, cancel the sale, okay? Now, if the property is sold at auction, however, either to the bank or to a third party, a document called a trustee's deed upon sale will need to be recorded with the county recorder's office. This document itself will establish the results of the auction and it will outline the change in ownership. Next slide, please. So the notice of default document, as mentioned before, is recorded when a borrower fails to meet any term of the loan. This is the beginning of the foreclosure process. And this is sort of the, uh, one of the most important thing that, that we like to tell people, that the clock is, is ticking at this point. Um, typically, this is the ideal time, or one of the most ideal times, uh, for a borrower to discuss applying for foreclosure prevention options, which might be available with their lender. Uh, the notice of default is required to contain certain specific information. The document will include the amount of money in default, uh, as uh, and, and when this amount was considered to be in default, so to give you a specific date. Additionally, it will include, usually, a description of the default as well as how to cure the default. It will also usually require the default to be cured by a certain date before the foreclosure advances to the next stage. Again, the important thing to realize uh, overall is that this document officially places a borrower into foreclosure. Next slide. Now, certain homeowner protections have been put in place um, and, and really are triggered by the notice of default or really, really need to be uh, entered into the document, the, the notice of default, uh, into the, the notice of default document. California Civil Code 2923.5 outlines several protections for borrowers who are in the foreclosure process. Most notably, the rule requires lenders to perform their due diligence in attempting to contact the borrower and provide several pieces of information. They must at least attempt to contact the borrower and discuss the idea that options related to saving the property may be available, as well as provide them with a telephone number to a Housing and Urban Development Certified Agency, or HUD, in order to explore those potential options. Now, the code does also outline that several attempts must be made by the lender to contact the borrower, both by mail and by phone. Now, it is important to remember that there will always be some exemptions to the rule. Not all lenders are required to follow this requirement of due diligence. The Homeowner's Bill of Rights, which is the next, uh, the next protection, outlines several other rules which most lenders are required to follow. Rules like providing a notification to a borrower which may enter foreclosure at, who might enter foreclosure 30 days before they might enter it. And this notice is going to be sent to a borrower and tell them, hey, there might be some options that you can explore to avoid going into this process. Um, the Homeowner's Bill of Rights also guarantees that a single point of contact for a borrower who is requesting assistance from the lender be appointed to that application. Now, this single point of contact may be one single person. It may be a team of people. But these people are required to be assigned to any application that a borrower submits to work that file. This guarantees a, a, a streamlined communication process, making sure that the borrower receives any up-to-date information, uh, you know, to, to, to really save their home if that's what they're attempting to do. Uh, additionally, 
there needs to be an acknowledgement of an application received, meaning if a borrower were to receive what's called a, a request for a mortgage assistance application and then turn around and submit everything in that application, a lender would have to send the borrower in writing a confirmation that the documents were received and whether or not the application itself is complete or not. Now, both the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the California Department of Business Oversight regulate these rules. They also take complaints from property owners who believe that these protections were not afforded to them. Next slide. Now, if a notice of default is not cured, meaning it hasn't been fixed, or if it hasn't been uh, you know, discussed, the following document that would be recorded with the county recorder's office would be a notice of trustee sale. Now, this document would need, is actually the last document needed to advance the foreclosure process. Uh, this document will include an actual date when the property is scheduled to be auctioned. The document will have a minimum bid, as well as what's called the trustee sale line. Now, the trustee sale line is a telephone number with a case number and, and most often a website where anybody can call, enter the information, and find out the most up-to-date information available as far as the status of the auction date. So like we mentioned before, when an auction date can be postponed or canceled or maybe it's sold, the trustee sale line is required to provide anybody with that information who calls or who looks on their website. Now, when this document is in fact recorded, a property owner may still apply for assistance. However, the options for assistance are significantly reduced. If nothing is done, the property, the property will typically be set for auction 21 days from the time the notice of trustee sale is recorded, but never earlier than 20 days. Next slide. Oh, forgive me. Are we, are we having problems here? The uh, slide kind of jumped off on my screen. Pan panelists, fellow panelists, should I just keep going? I have a copy of the slides. Okay, uh, trust, we're on trustee Z one sales. Correct, excellent, okay. So once the property is in fact sold, the trustee deed upon sale is going to be recorded. The trustee's deed upon sale will actually indicate the transfer of the ownership to the winning bidder at the auction, whether it be the lender or it be a third party. The document being recorded makes the actual sale official. And in reality, it requires the borrower to be aware that immediate action is going to be necessary. There would be a new owner of this property. Occupants need to be aware of what's going to happen next. Well, what happens next? Next slide. So after foreclosure, the trustees deed upon sale, that document completes the foreclosure. What happens next? A notice of, to vacate would be submitted to any occupant who is currently in the property. Now, if the property is vacant, certain uh, other, other processes need to be followed. But in reality, a notice to vacate is going to be submitted by the new owner to anybody who's occupying the property. If a previous owner is occupying the property, they're going to receive a three-day notice to vacate, which would tell them that they're, they're going to have three days before this new owner would begin the official foreclosure, um, I'm sorry, the official eviction process. Now, if a tenant occupies the property, that tenant may receive a longer notice before the eviction process starts, depending on the status of the tenant, depending on if the tenant is either up to, do, up to date with their rent, depending on if the tenant is also, uh, or if the owner is a roommate of the tenant. There, there's a lot of different things that kind of go into uh, whether or not a tenant is afforded this extra protection. Um, now, normally with the notice to vacate, a cash for keys negotiation is offered to these individuals. Now, cash for keys is an industry term used to describe a negotiation between the current occupant or occupants of the property and the new owner. Typically, the new owner will offer in exchange for uh, avoiding a formal eviction through the courts uh, terms for the occupant vacating the property. So they might say, uh, listen, I understand you're a previous owner, or I understand you are a tenant and the property just foreclosed. 
uh, I'm willing to offer you maybe an extra, for example, 30 days. You gather all your things in 30 days and leave, and I will avoid the foreclosure process. Uh, sometimes they might say, if you can leave in five days, I might give you a certain amount of money to gather your things and leave. Uh, now, while these negotiations are not required by law, they do occur frequently. It's not something that a new owner would be required to, to and this negotiation, this negotiation isn't required uh, by the new owner to enter into. But it, it, it's entered into frequently, uh, it's really around the idea of a graceful exit for the occupant. And both parties sort of benef benefit because uh, the, the occupant can have time and a little bit of control to leave the property. And the owner doesn't have to go through the stress of worrying that they have to go to court, they have to file this eviction, they have to pay this money. Um, it, it, it's something that does happen often. Um, now, what would a person do if they were not aware of a foreclosure because maybe their lender didn't notify them? You know, maybe they didn't receive the calls from the lender that they, that they were supposed to make. Now, the Los Angeles County has a homeowner notification program, which I believe was, was had begun to be discussed by my colleague, La, Leticia Andrade. Um, but the program was set up to really address these type of issues, to, to become a notification for people who are experiencing things like this. Um, so I think I'd like to hand it off back to uh, Letty, uh, so she can provide some additional information on the program and uh, its functionality. Yes, thank you, Sam. Um, so, as mentioned in the beginning, the homeowner notification program will mail a copy of the grant deed to all interested parties involved. Oops, yes, perfect. A grant deed is used to transfer real property from one person or entity to another person or entity. The grant deed is basically written proof that an individual owns a property. I'm sorry, could we go to slide? 16. Perfect, thank you. So here, this is a sample of a grant deed. On most recorded documents, you will find terms like grantor. A grantor is the person giving up ownership. A grantee is the party receiving ownership. You'll also find a legal description on the document. A legal description is a written statement that describes where a particular plot of land is located. It is usually one or two paragraphs or could be a few pages long. This statement is a legal requirement and must be included on the grant deed to the property. The grant deed is completed and signed by the grantor and must be notarized. Next, please. A quick claim deed is similar to the grant deed where it transfers ownership as well. A quick claim deed releases any interest in real property and passes that interest to another person. On this document, you will also find the grantor, a grantee, and legal description. Just like the grant deed, it must be signed by the grantor and notarized. Some people might ask, what's the difference between a grant deed and a quick claim deed? A grant deed is used to transfer ownership or real property and proving that the title has not already been granted to another person. A quick claim deed transfers the owner's entire interest, if any, in the property to the person receiving the property. Next, please. If you take out a loan against your property, the homeowner notification program will send you a copy of the recorded deed of trust. This document explains the terms to your loan. You'll find terms like borrower or mortgager. The borrower or mortgager is the owner. The lender or mortgagee is the person or legal entity providing the loan to the borrower. On the documents, you will find a trustee. The trustee is a mutual third party who holds the legal title to a property until the borrower pays off the loan in full. They're called a trustee because they hold the property in a trust for the lender. The trustee is also held partly responsible for the loan repayment if the borrower fails to repay the loan. In this case, the trustee will likely sell the property in order to repay the loan. 
Once the loan has been repaid, the trustee is responsible for transferring the legal title of the property to the borrower. To do this, the trustee must file a deed of reconveyance with the local county recorder or deeds registry. Next, please. As part of the homeowner notification program, if the property is in foreclosure, you may receive a notice of default. The notice of default is the first step of a foreclosure as mentioned before by Sam. The notice of default is recorded by a lender after a borrower fails to meet the terms of their loan. The document will provide information on default amount, the name of the borrower, the name of the lender, and the property's address. Next, please. In addition, the homeowner notification program will also send the notice of trustee sale. This is the second stage of the foreclosure. As mentioned before, the notice of trustee sale is recorded no earlier than 90 days after the notice of default. The notice of trustee sale states that the trustee will sell your home at auction in 20 days. If you receive a notice, you want to look out for your name, look out for your name and the property address. The notice should have the date, time, and location of the foreclosure sale. It will also include the trustee's name, address, and phone number. The trustee sale line will provide updates whether the sale was postponed, canceled, or is, an, or is active to sell. Next, please. How we can help. You should contact us and speak with one of our counselors if any of the following occurs. You did not give full or partial ownership of your home to someone else. Your signature was forged on the document. The document was changed after you signed it. The document contains an incorrect property description. The documents are incomplete or unreadable, or the documents have been sent to you in error. In addition, if you receive a notice of default or a notice of trustee sale, you should contact our, you should contact our office so we can discuss how we can help you. Next, please. Uh, you may contact us in person, however, right now it's not available, but our main office is located on 500 West Temple Street in LA. Our satellite office is located in Alhambra, and you may also contact us um, by phone at 833-238-4450. Next. Follow us for scam alerts, consumer business news, and more on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our information is listed on the slide there. And next. And so now we have questions. If anybody have any questions. Hi, Letty. Going back to one of the questions that we received earlier from Luis, uh, with regard to judicial versus non-judicial foreclosure, what determines which one a lender can choose to uh, pursue? Sam, do you want to go ahead and take this one? Sure. So um, the the lender would in fact be benefited. Um, by recording what's called a deed of trust. Now that deed of trust outlines that they would not be required to go to court to foreclose against the property, meaning they would not be required to go the judicial route to foreclose against the property. Um, the the non-judicial foreclosure would be when a lender records what's called a mortgage against the property. Um, and that document would require that they go to court uh, to foreclose against the property and recover any losses. Great, and it looks like we have some more questions. How long does the lender have to file a notice of default? So certain actual um, guidelines in a loan would dictate when a lender is actually required to file a notice of default. Now, because the, uh, in California, when a deed of trust is recorded, it's a secured instrument, it's secured against a, a property. Now, there are not any, um, how, would, how would you say, um, limitations, statute of limitations on secured liens. 
So if a second, for example, a second lien were to be sold to somebody in 2009, and maybe the second lien holder at, who had purchased the property thought, you know, I think I want to hold on to this debt, and I don't want to file the notice of default yet. I want to go and wait till property values rise. Um, there would be no limitation as to how long they can wait to file the notice of default. If, I hope that answers the question. And then we have uh, one more question. It looks like uh, regarding um, uh, oh, a few more questions. But one question from uh, Susan, I believe, was if uh, we're aware of any uh, financial assistance to help um, individuals in foreclosure. Uh, they mentioned that uh, Keep Your Home California may have already depleted their funds. Um, so if there's other programs that we're aware of, or we connect, uh, homeowners to. Uh, so to address that 1, uh, that person, uh, and I'm not sure who it was, forgive me. Uh, I'm not able to sort of follow this as quickly as I'd like, um, but keep your home California. Yes, they did exhaust their funds. I want to say it was the beginning of 2018. Um, they had stopped pushing out money to uh, homeowners who were in. In need of them. Um, currently, I believe there is, uh, and I, I would have to double check for you right now, um, but I believe there is a fund for people who are experiencing um, losses. But I want to, I also want to say it might be limited to people who are landlords. Um, the other idea, though, is that because of COVID, certain loans, which are which are backed by what's called GSEs or government sponsored enterprises are uh, affected by the foreclosure moratorium. Now, there are certain rules outlined by the foreclosure moratorium, um, which would allow a property owner to apply for a temporary forbearance of three months um, after that forbearance has ended a, um, I believe a month by month forbearance would be granted depending on the person's situation. Now, what that actual prove up is, meaning what it would take or what documents it would take you to provide or what it would, you know, maybe it's just a phone call. Maybe it's, you know, something from your employer. Um, you know, I don't know exactly. It really depends on the requirements that the GSEs have set up. Um, outside of that, there, I, I really don't know of anything additional. Um, let me, give, give me one second. Let me take a look and see if I can find if there are any additional monetary assistance programs that exist. Right. And I could just add a couple of things to that too. Uh, in the past few weeks, we've heard of uh, the Board of Supervisors create um, rent relief funds. Um, and I believe this was more aimed towards providing rental assistance. Uh, however, that, inf that assistance would be then passed on to, to the landlords. Uh, at this moment, we there's not a a relief fund specifically designed for homeowners. Most of the relief that we're aware of, and that's through the unincorporated area of the counties and also through the city of Los Angeles, they have all established rent relief funds where a tenant can apply for assistance and then that assistance would be provided to, to the landlord. Okay, there's a few more questions, George. Um, uh, yes, it looks like uh, one of the questions was, is the process different for federally backed mortgages versus non uh, federally backed uh, mortgages? The, uh, th did, did that person mean the process of foreclosure? Uh, I think it's safe to assume, yeah, it was okay. uh, regarding foreclosure, okay. but um, Susan, uh, feel free to elaborate if you would like. Let's see. So I'm trying to trying to read everything coming through here. Well, and, and maybe we could just touch a little bit up on, on that. Um, what happens is when when someone signs the documentation, right? So it's going to be the promissory note and the deed of trust. Uh, there may be a situation where the initial lender is there to fund the loan. But a lot of times, a lot of these finance companies, what they end up doing is they'll sell the loan 
to what we call the secondary market, right? So that's when you hear things about mortgage-backed securities or it gets sold to Fannie and Fred, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, I apologize for that. Uh, and then in some situations, they can turn around and also do their own securitization. Um, generally, when it's a situation like that, uh, the California rules still apply. Um, however, there may be situations uh, like in a reverse mortgage, uh, so that's a, a loan that was issued through the Federal Housing Administration, and the timelines for those type of foreclosures may differ just a little bit compared to the process that we just explained earlier. But for the most part, it's going to be the California foreclosure process is the one that's going to take precedence here. And then are we aware of any uh, changes happening right now? This is kind of outside of um, what we do, but are we aware of any changes happening uh, or assistance with property taxes in LA County? Um, I think I think I, I, I can answer that. So um, attending a, a recent um, you know, webinar just like this with the property tax collector, and the assessor's office and other departments in the county. Um, the LA County property tax collector is bound by state law to collect property taxes, right? Um, they are not allowed to waive property taxes on their own um, because the, it, it, it's above them, uh, despite the COVID issue. Now, what the LA County property tax collector has, has um, I guess you could say uh, promised is that if if you have been affected by the COVID virus and you have not been able to pay your property taxes, they are willing to look at your individual situation and waive penalties and late fees for not paying your property taxes on time. And that is something that is given that that's the that's something that the power is given to them by the state to waive beyond those fees and and um you know uh, beyond those fees they not the the, the tax collector cannot decide to waive property taxes period uh thank you sam um and rosie yeah uh, it does look like uh for the time being um un unless further intervention that uh uh, they're willing to work with the taxes, but they're still due, correct? Team? <laughs> yes, absolutely. The taxes are still going to be due. Um, but now th the important thing to realize, though, is that the property tax collector will take every request um, for deferment, meaning the, uh, the avoidance of the, ta the, the late fees and the penalties on an individual basis. So what they actually require for you to provide to them that's going to be up to them and they're going to make the, their determination the law gives them that right to make their own individual determination that this is a valid complaint um and however they do that is going to be up to them now if that was going to be changed that would have to be changed at the, the state level the law at the state level um but the local county authority doesn't have the ability to, to make that call and then a question from Lisa, does the lender file another document indicating the property is no longer in default? Um, or how else would a homeowner confirm that their loan is no longer in default status if they would pay or negotiate? Right, okay. Um, so when a, I believe the law says when a permanent foreclosure alternative has been engaged or entered into, the lender would be required to record what's called a cancellation of a notice of default, right? Um, this document would basically let the world know that the notice of default, yes, it was recorded, yes, they found behind, yes, it got this far, but now this loan is back in current standing and it's required to be recorded, I believe by the civil code is 30 days from the time that the uh, the permanent foreclosure alternative has been entered into. Now, the reason, well, let me ask, has, are you in this sort of situation where you've fixed a loan, you're back in current standing, 
because the law would require that you're actually back in current standing and not in a, um, you know, maybe a trial period or something like that. Okay, we'll see if Lisa has um, some more information to provide. Um, meanwhile, um, going on to Rosie's question, um, what assistance can folks with private loans get locally? Um, maybe we can just touch on um, who our, our services are for um, at DCBA. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is, because I believe there was another question about, I'm sorry about that. Uh, there's another question about GSC loans and what is the likelihood of a deferral after forbearance? So, so the reliefs that are offered is, is ultimately going to depend on who owns the loan. So we talked about the GSCs and what that means is government sponsored enterprises. And those are the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Uh, and they are controlled by the um, Federal Housing Finance Agency. So that's the, the controlling bot or the body of government that, that controls or oversees the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And they come out with their own guidelines on how they're going to proceed with foreclosures or what assistance they're going to offer. The Federal Housing Administration is the same. So those are things with FHA loans uh, or um, reverse mortgages that are, are guaranteed by the FHA. And then also VA and USDA loans. So they all have their own. Um, when it comes to loans that were made under a California finance lender license or a California mortgage lender, uh, I believe the executive order from the, the governor's office also um, put a stop on foreclosures. Uh, and then also we have situations like private loans. So loans that are done by what we call hard money lenders or a private individual. And, at, and th in those type of situations, there really isn't any uh, guidelines or requirements for them to enter into a, uh, a a deferral process or anything like that. However, because um, because the California courts have been closed for a while, and actually there was uh, action to to halt eviction cases, um, it, it's possible that a a loan may go through the foreclosure process. However, whoever purchased that property at the auction is unable to evict um, the the property owner because because of the, um, the closure of the courts, basically. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I see a question from um, Rhonda. Uh, my original uh, holder sold our mortgage to another lender. Uh, because they are out of state, do they still need to abide by California laws? Uh, okay, so I'm not sure if you're referring to the lender that sold the loan or the person or the lender that purchased the loan. But yes, they're still required to follow, follow the California uh, foreclosure framework um, that, that Sam touched lightly on, um, unless it's one of these but I don't think it is. But if it's a um, a uh, like a HUD type loan, there's there may be a slight difference. But for the most part, they still have to follow the California foreclosure process. Okay. And then the last question, Clem, you already touched on this, but someone was uh, Carla's asking: Is there any help for small landlords to help with mortgage payments? And we can talk about uh, the county's program for unincorporated. Right. So, depending on the jurisdiction that you live in, again, if it's in the unincorporated area county, um, I know that the Board of Supervisors created a fund to uh, for rent relief, and that's available to tenants and landlords. Uh, they both would have to work together to apply for this. Um, I, I can't. I'm not sure if those programs are still available. But on the other side of that, um, the director of the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Uh, decided to expand our foreclosure prevention services 
to small landlords. So this would be anybody that has 15 or fewer units and would need assistance with their mortgage. Um, then they could contact our department and one of our foreclosure counselors can assist with contacting your lender and exploring your options. Um, again, that's exploring the options with the bank, meaning if there's something other than a for forbearance or once your forbearance plan ends, if there is a possibility of doing a loan modification, which is an option, then that's something that would be um, you know, discussed or reviewed. Uh, as far as monetary, again, it's going to be depending on if these funds are still available through either uh, one of the board offices or another jurisdiction like the city of Los Angeles had something similar. Yes, and for the county program, you can call 211 if the funds are still available to apply. All right, that's it. So I just wanna thank our presenters. Uh, and we understand that this is a real difficult, stressful time for most people. According to the California Employment Development Department, over 9.7 million unemployment insurance claims have been filed and nearly $60 million in benefits have been paid since March uh, 14 of this year. Uh, as we discussed, the CARES Act, state and local efforts have delayed foreclosures and evictions for several months. However, many of those protections have ended or will expire soon, and now more than ever, property owners and tenants will rely on service providers to help them navigate this issue. So for all the service providers with us today, please help us get the word out and steer people towards reliable help. And if you or someone you know is facing foreclosure, please remember that DCBA is here to help. Our services are free and confidential. Our well-trained staff can work with you and your lender to explore all your options to save your home. Thank you and have a good day.